One of the discoveries that emerged out of uh, <coughs> modern quantum theory is that uh, so-called empty space isn't really empty at all. It's actually full of energy. So instead of being like kind of a quiet, empty lake, it's more like the froth at the base of a waterfall or something. And this energy is basically electromagnetic in nature. And uh, <coughs> the energy density is uh, quite high. In fact, it's so high that when it was first discovered mathematically, it was thought to be some kind of artifact of the mathematics. But then as time went on, there were even Nobel Prize winning experiments that showed that this energy in so-called empty space was really there. We don't usually notice it because um, it's so homogeneously distributed. It sort of be like sitting in a bathtub with uh, at exactly your body temperature. You might not notice notice the water, but under certain circumstances, it can be um, disturbed or perturbed, and then it has has effects. As I mentioned, some some effects on atomic emission, for example, is what eventually ended up uh, in a Nobel Prize for Willis Lamb of Yale University, and it's called the Lamb Shift. And this is a recognition that, in fact, uh, this energy disturbs atoms. So atoms aren't sitting in a void. They're sitting in this sea of energy. So once uh, quantum theorists realized that energy was there, the next question was, well, <coughs> is there any way to tap it? And it was thought uh, originally that probably not. It might be like trying to tap the heat energy around us. And uh, you can quickly prove for thermodynamic reasons that uh, it'll take more energy to tap it then you'd get out of it so you don't come out ahead. But back in uh, about 1984, a researcher at Hughes Laboratory by the name of Robert Forward uh, showed that there was a particular effect called the Casimir effect, which demonstrated that, in fact, this energy could be tapped. Well, when you go to look at the numbers, you find out that there's enough energy in the volume of a coffee cup to say, evaporate all the world's oceans if you could get it all of it. So this raised the issue among uh, <coughs> theorists, well, can we manipulate this energy? Uh, could we tap it for spaceflight application, for example? And um, there are a couple ways to go. Could we get propulsion out of it? Could we use it as an energy source? And so these are the areas that modern theorists are looking at. But one of the more interesting aspects is that if, in fact, it does look like there's a route from here to there, then you know we consider the possibility that, well, maybe there are other civilizations who've been down this track ahead of us. And so it opens up the possibility that you can't reject the possibility of, for example, ET visitation out of hand. Usually here, where you, Einstein said you can't go fast in the speed of light. Well, that's something out of special theory of relativity, and it really is that you can't take an object and speed it up and then through the light barrier, because it would take an infinite amount of energy and mass to do it. <coughs> but it turns out it's a faulty conclusion to say, therefore, you can't go fast in the speed of light, because once you get into general relativity, you have some options. The options are to change the properties of space itself, so that locally, the velocity of light is engineered to be faster than the usual value. The best way to explain how it is, uh, how, it, how it comes about, is that it's actually the idea of uh, stretching space, expanding space on one side of the craft and shrinking space on the other. So that you're not only moving forward through space, but the space itself is like moving forward on a rubber sheet while at the same time you're pulling the rubber sheet and expanding it. So then relative to the outside environment, you can be going at, say, the speed of light along the rubber sheet, but if the rubber sheet itself is moving relative to the rest of the universe, then your net motion is uh, faster than the speed of light. So the implication then is, well, if you can manipulate this zero-point energy C, get it out of the way, then if something tried to accelerate you, it, it would be easy. You would have no, quote, inertia. It'd be, you know, Rather than using humongous amounts of energy to um, try to propel you through this tremendous force drag that you get from the vacuum fluctuations, um, you could throw BBs out the back, I suppose, and take off like a shot. And so, in fact, the Air Force uh, was sufficiently interested in that that they set up a program called mass modification, 
in which I and my colleagues were interviewed to find out uh, all the details of our modeling inertia as a vacuum fluctuation phenomena that might in principle be manipulated to see if there was a possibility in some far distant future of reducing the inertia of a spaceship so that ordinary propulsive means could be used with relatively low energy requirements. And so they did a year-long study and uh, went around to various uh, universities and laboratories and asked people to tell them about um, experiments they might be able to do to determine whether our model was correct. So again, there's, there's another indication that uh, these are not just uh, fringe scientists with science fiction ideas, uh, but that basically the, these are kind of mainstream ideas being published in mainstream physics journals and being taken seriously by mainstream um, military and uh, NASA type funders. A whole volume of space would be in a special state, so um, the pilots, for example, would not feel inertial forces either. And so under those conditions of promoting a situation in which you get rapid inertia of a spaceship, um, <coughs> the people inside would, under those same space manipulated conditions, not feel tremendous inertial forces. Uh, here at the Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, one of our main interests is exploring the possibility of uh, tapping or mining this vacuum fluctuation energy, zero-point energy. By the way, we call it zero point because even if you froze the universe down all the way down to absolute zero, where most motion would be frozen out, uh, this energy would still be there. It's a very fundamental kind of energy. <coughs> but we're looking to see if we can extract it for many uses, not just spaceflight application. Um, <coughs> I mean, the, the grand uh, outcome would be that if you could use it uh, to power everything from electric toothbrushes to aircraft carriers to automobiles to homes to to space flight. Uh, <coughs> one of the main uh, areas of interest actually um, in terms of potential use that uh, we've been approached by many people is the possibility of having a very cheap energy source for desalinization, which is very hard to make antimatter in large quantities and uh, keep it bottled up. Uh, but it has been, it has been done. Um, protons, antiprotons have been generated in accelerator experiments and then captured and, and kept uh, contained for some periods of time. <laughs> so that's, that's an area that I know the Air Force is, has been interested in and, and pursues research on. Uh, you know, sometime before this millennium is out, I'm certain that uh, probably that will come to use if there aren't other alternatives that, that are simpler. I routinely make presentations and briefings to various branches of the government. Um, I've been taken out on aircraft carriers by the Navy and shown uh, what it is that we have to replace if we have new energy sources to uh, provide new fuel methods. Um, <coughs> of course, NASA is funding some of these breakthrough propulsion physics ideas. The Air Force, various labs in the Air Force are pursuing um, fundamental studies on these kind of exotic ideas. So, so there is a lot of uh, government interest. It's getting to the point where modern theoretical physicists are loath to rule out any possibility. I mean, now we're talking about uh, parallel universes and membranes of many dimensions. And uh, I mean, the physics is, is just getting as wild as it can possibly be. <coughs> and sandwiched in among all those alternative possibilities is the possibility that uh, some of these concepts might actually play a role in, in space flight application where uh, civilizations, ourselves in the future, or maybe more advanced ET civilizations at present, could perhaps uh, travel long distances in relatively short times. Of course, we see claims, uh, and not just uh, 
among the public, but among uh, military pilots and um, good observers, uh, typically in the military, that there appear to be something like craft flying around with anomalous behavior. On the other hand, in terms of some of the characteristics that seem to be attributed to them, um, and given the kind of physics and the direction the physics is going, you can't rule out that uh, well, maybe, maybe some are, are some kind of craft or probes, maybe even more likely probes and craft from some faraway civilization. Of course, one of the intriguing things uh, as we start looking into the possibility of reducing inertia um, and so on, <clears throat> and then you see these supposed sightings in the sky which turn on a dime, right angle turn, and so on. And the reason we used to reject those out of hand was that it appeared to be that there was no inertia there. And uh, until recently, that was sort of an inconceivable idea to a physicist. <coughs> so I think a physicist is probably pretty justified in saying, you know, that, that doesn't sound like anything I can imagine to be a craft. Could imagine it to be some form of plasma phenomenon or whatever, but, but not a craft. And so now as we get this new evidence of, well, okay, maybe inertia can be modified, then it does make you sort of sit back and take a second thought about it. But when you consider that uh, our electromagnetic technology is, you know, a century old, basically, <coughs> and then realize that you could have advanced civilizations out there that are millennia beyond us, uh, there really is no way of, of saying whether they might have some other way of making contact or find other ways like wormholes of just sending probes here or whatever, it could be well beyond our imagination. The case that NORAD has uncorrelated targets um, that they can't uh, account for. And um, from time to time, satellites see things called fast walkers, seem to be energetic um, signatures uh, moving faster than can be accounted for by known planes, for example. People of some credibility and credentialing are willing to come forth and say, despite the giggle factor for this area, we think there's something there that should be taken more seriously. Well, it's, it's another mark that um, kind of an idea whose time has come to take it seriously. It should not be an area considered taboo by modern scientists. Here you have a guy who shows up before congressional committees doing whistleblowing activities and under circumstances where a lot of people, if they could find holes in his credibility, would have been more than glad to try to destroy his stories and his credibility, and they didn't. And so then you suddenly have a fellow like that coming forward and saying that uh, he has evidence from his own experience that uh, there was crash retrievals and technologies that he personally was involved in distributing out. Why would a guy with that kind of background make it up? I had a chance to ask him about it once. And he said, well, the way it came out in the book is not exactly the way it was, but uh, it's really that uh, we waited until there were developments in regular American industry. And then uh, we would salt stuff in that might accelerate those developments. It isn't that the developments got started on the basis of what we had because we didn't want anybody to know we had it. You can't uh, probably dismiss it out of hand because it's hard to come up with a reason why he would have just made it up because he's a very sort of patriotic kind of guy. So it, it, that, that is really an enigma. This shows, this shows the cutaway. You can see the, uh, the uh, four ejection seats. Actually, there, there are two facing us, but there are also two that are sort of facing away from us on the other side of that central column. You can see the, uh, the oxygen tanks down here in the corner. 
uh, that, that actually go all the way around the inside of the skirt.